Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to be doing a solved question mark case. It is solved in the eyes of the law. I'm going to be very interested to hear your thoughts at the end of this video. So having said that, let's get into the case of Sharon Mason. So in 1983, Sharon Lee Mason was a very bright 14 year old schoolgirl. And so bright, in fact, that she'd actually been the ducks of her primary school. Sharon had a casual after-school job at a fish and chip shop called Mosman Park Seafoods. And Mosman Park was actually the suburb in which Sharon lived. And Sharon actually worked at this fish and chip shop with her best friend, from school, Jane Reynolds. However, both Sharon and Jane pretty much hated working at this fish and chip shop. Jane described it as horrible work for pretty much next to nothing pay. And just a funny side note of a story, when I was 14, I worked at a fish and chip shop and I hated it and got next to nothing pay and I was fired. So there's that unimportant story. Sharon's mother's name was April Fawcett and her father's name was Michael Mason, and they were separated at the time. On February the 19th, 1983, which was a bloody hot 40 degree Saturday morning, Sharon and her best friend Jane decided to make a quick trip, like girls trip out, I guess, to the Fremantle markets. It was a very quick trip, however, because Sharon had told Jane she needed to be home by midday. So they went to the markets in the morning, they got some hot chips before they left, and they both caught the same bus home. I don't know why Sharon had to be home by 12. I couldn't find any information about this, but regardless, they got on the bus and the first person to get off the bus was actually Sharon at Mosman Park where she lived. As Sharon got off, Jane waved goodbye to Sharon and Sharon waved back and smiled. And this was actually the last credible sighting of Sharon Mason. When Sharon didn't return home that day, her family of course began to worry and she was reported missing by that evening. It didn't take long for this missing person's case to reach the media. A missing 14 year old schoolgirl was bound to make headlines and it did. Of course I wasn't around in 1983 to remember how big of a news story it was or if it made national headlines but at least here in Perth this was a big news story of the time. Strangely though, the photograph that was circulated of Sharon was actually two years old. So she was 12 in the photograph. And when you're 14, 12 to 14 is a big jump in physical appearance. So I found this very strange. And I'm not even sure if the photo that they sort of circulate now is of when she was 12 or 14, but I don't know why they didn't use a more recent photo at the time. Police also carried out a reenactment of Sharon's last movements when she got off the bus at Mosman Park. Many, many people ended up coming forward in this case, claiming they had seen Sharon after she had disappeared, including her own father who claimed to see Sharon in the car park of his block of flats a week after she went missing. A friend of Sharon's also came forward saying she saw Sharon on the day she went missing. She found Sharon crying in a laneway by herself and they decided to hitchhike to Perth City. From the city they got to Mundaring in a red sports car with a mystery man that I guess picked them up in the city. Apparently the man in the red sports car tried to have sex with Sharon unsuccessfully I presume before the three headed back to the city with this mystery man. The friend of Sharon's said this man dropped her off at the causeway and she left Sharon in this red sports car and that's the last time she saw Sharon. Another witness claims they saw Sharon in a white panel van with two young men stating to them that she just wanted to go home. A woman thinks she saw Sharon waving frantically from the back of an American styled pickup ute. And yet another witness, a couple in fact, swear they saw Sharon walking along Sterling Highway at quite a hurried 
place at around 10.30 p.m. the evening she went missing. Early on in the investigation, Sharon's father, Michael Mason, was a suspect in her disappearance. He was questioned by detectives and even kept under surveillance for a period of time. And despite never being charged with his daughter's disappearance, Rumours always swirled around Michael Mason that he had something to do with it. So as with far too many of these missing persons cases, days turn into weeks, weeks into months, and months into years. Sharon's mother and those closest to her held out hope that Sharon was still out there somewhere. Her mother, April, tried to keep her daughter's name in the media over the years, but it was said that her daughter's disappearance absolutely destroyed April. Tragically, two years after Sharon's disappearance, her father, Michael Mason, took his own life. It is actually unknown why, although I personally speculate the stress from the rumors and from his daughter's disappearance potentially took a toll. And at the time of his death, his daughter was still missing. We're going to fast forward nine years to July of 1992. In Mosman Park, again, the suburb where Sharon lived, two bobcats, which are like those, I'll put a photo on the screen of what a bobcat is because I can't explain that kind of thing, but they were doing some earthworks behind this old set of shops like in a car park at the request of the shop owners. And during this process of doing the earthworks, the Bobcat, Bobcat operators made a horrifying discovery and that was they think they found some human remains. And of course, police were notified immediately. The major crime squad showed up at the discovery site not long after, and soon began the difficult task of sifting and collecting. It wasn't long before they found skeletal remains, some big, some small. They found some ribs, some long bones, some upper limbs, and some vertebrae. A jawbone was also found, which was held up for all the detectives to see. And at this same time, I believe, another really kind of disturbing discovery was made. Pulled from the dirt was a grotesque looking face mask, like a Halloween style fancy dress shop face mask. I'll put it on the screen so you get the idea. It was quite terrifying really. Detectives also discover a pale blue or a white plastic bag containing the lower limbs of a human body as well as a pair of white bikini style underwear that had had stains on it. So the lower limbs found in the plastic bag were actually only partially decomposed. So just keep that thought in your head for now as we continue on. The most important find of the day, however, besides the body itself or the remains, was one singular clear human fingerprint found on a piece of adhesive tape. After further testing was conducted, it was confirmed to be the remains of missing 14-year-old schoolgirl Sharon Mason. Detectives ran a check of all the shop owners from 1983, the shops that were in front of the car park where Sharon was discovered. And one stood out in particular, and that was a shop called Prunella Fashions. Prunella Fashions was a dress shop owned by Arthur Greer, and records show that five months after Sharon's disappearance, he sold up his business and moved on. Detectives also ran a background check on Greer, and found that he had a very colorful past. He moved to Australia in the 60s from Belfast, and he also had a substantial criminal record. He had two counts of indecent assault, one count of battery of his wife, indecent assault of his daughter, and charges for attempting to kill an ex girlfriend and two former friends with his car. And he does venomously deny all of these charges just for the record. Arthur Greer was soon arrested and questioned at length by detectives. He denied knowing Sharon, being involved in her death, or even knowing anything about the case. However, detectives had a theory about Greer and Sharon. And remember how I said that Sharon really hated her job at the fish and chip shop? 
Well, detective, detectives theorised that Greer had a help wanted sign in the window of his dress shop, Prunella Fashions, which was in Mosman Park where Sharon lived. She possibly saw this sign in the window and thought she would apply for a job. So she potentially went in that morning, that Saturday morning, she went missing to the dress shop where she met Greer and asked about a job. Detectives think this is when he killed Sharon and dismembered her body in the bathroom at the back of his store. They believe he put her remains in two separate plastic bags and tied them with yellow ribbons from his dress shop and buried them in a small garden shed that sat about a meter behind his store in the car park. And they believe that he basically lifted up the pavings of the shed and dug a pretty damn deep hole. It would have had to have been about nine feet and buried her remains there. It should be noted the shed was no longer standing at the time Sharon's remains were found. Arthur Greer was charged pretty quickly over Sharon's death and at the trial the Crown presented a completely circumstantial case on Greer. So everything they had in this case was circumstantial. There was no forensic evidence whatsoever. They were basing Greer being guilty off basically his criminal past and of course the fact his shop was where Sharon's remains were found. No witnesses had seen Sharon walk into Greer's store on the day she went missing. In fact, they couldn't actually find anyone to even testify that there was a help wanted sign in Greer's shop window at the time that Sharon went missing. And you may remember me mentioning a fingerprint found with Sharon's remains. Well, that was not Greer's either. I don't know whose fingerprint that was, but it was not Arthur Greer's. The yellow tires that tied the plastic bags with Sharon's remains in were brought up at the trial. Initially, they said those yellow ribbon tires were exclusive to Prunella, Prunella fashions, but it did later come out that these were really common yellow tires, in fact, and heaps of stores in the area used the exact same ones. The grotesque face mask was also another subject raised in court. Greer said he had never seen that face mask in his life. However, his son actually testified against him, stating quite the opposite. His son, John, told police that that was his father's face mask and he'd seen him put it on and a gallivant around his store. In 1993, Arthur Greer was found guilty of willful being intentional homicide. Now, just going off topic for a second. I can't say the M-U-R-D-E-R word anymore on YouTube because they will strike me down. So I am saying homicide in its place. So bear with me while I use this alternative wording in this case. I know homicide is slightly different. Homicide being I believe, I'm not like a expert obviously, <laughs> I believe homicide is when one person kills another person. It can be under legal or illegal circumstances where M-U-R-D-E-R is always illegal. Greer was sentenced to strict security life imprisonment, but due to a legal technicality, this verdict or this conviction was actually thrown out. The following year, a retrial was conducted and Greer was found guilty of the lesser homicide, M-U-R-D-E-R, and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of seven years. However, Greer fought this conviction all the way to the high court. In May of 1997, Arthur Greer was represented pro bono, which is like for free or very cheap, by the WA Chief Justice Wayne Martin. Many actually consider Arthur Greer's case as one of the biggest injustices that Western Australia has ever seen. Private investigators, lawyers, and politicians have all come out in support of Greer over the years. Many describing the prosecution's case against Greer as flimsy due to the lack of forensic evidence and the loose theory that was formed by the circumstantial evidence. Former WA Chief Forensic Pathologists Clive Cook and Derek 
Pocock have both voiced their doubts about how the Crown in the trial came to the conclusion of how Sharon's remains got to that car park. Pocock believes there was a noticeable degree of deterioration, deterioration, I can't say that word, <laughs> between uh, Sharon's upper half and lower half of her body. He believes Sharon's lower half, which was found in that plastic bag, was most likely frozen for the better half or the better part of those nine years before she was discovered. So you may remember me stating that some of the remains were only partially decomposed when they were dug up. Just think about the fact it had been nine years sitting in the Australian sun, nine Australian summers, exposed to the elements, and her body was partially decomposed. It just doesn't make sense. There's also been questions about the plumbing and excavation work that has been done in that car park over the years and the fact that Sharon's body was never uncovered in all this time. The Innocence Project in WA, Western Australia, has also been working on Arthur Greer's case and they believe there is a lot more to this case than what was initially thought and more to what happened to Sharon on the day she went missing. They theorize that Greer burying Sharon in that spot under that shed on that day would have been near impossible. It was a 40 degree day when Sharon went missing and those slabs in the shed were very heavy and the soil would have been very dry due to the heat and presumably pretty hard to dig through, let alone a single man digging through nine feet worth of it. And Greer would have had to have dug about nine feet to be in line with where Sharon's body was eventually found nine years later. And just think about how tall someone that is like six foot, seven foot is, add it two more feet, nine feet are way down. <laughs> the Innocence Project also had it mathematically worked out where the shed stood in 1983 from an old photo I'm going to put these up on the screen and where Sharon's body was found in comparison and it was discovered the shed and where the body had been buried did not line up to be the same spot. If this is the case then Greer obviously could not have buried Sharon under his shed on the day she went missing. And add to that the fact that Arthur Greer refused to admit guilt through his whole sentence, despite the fact it would have allowed him an earlier release from prison. And as a result of this, instead of serving the seven years, was it, that he was allocated, he served 25. I'm just going to say this now, I am not putting my opinion in this video, I'm telling you the facts from investigations and other people's investigations and what has happened over the years. Another huge supporter of Greer's was someone I mentioned in my Eric Edgar Cook video and someone that was also accused wrongfully of a horrible crime and that is John Button. Button went to jail for five years for killing his girlfriend with his car and it was later found out, 40 years later found out, he didn't do it. He was exonerated 40 years later, I should say. Button was also the chairman of the Innocence Project. I don't know when, but I'm guessing at some time in the 2000s. He reiterated the fact the case had no physical or forensic evidence and had no eyewitnesses and labelled the case as flawed. And Button was so determined to make sure an innocent man was not locked up in jail, he conducted his own investigation on this case. He actually did his own dig in the area where Sharon's remains were found and found a key piece of evidence that cast doubt on the prosecution's case. He found a sewage pipe and a storm water pipe, both having been placed in the ground of the car park where Sharon was found in 1992. And he did check with manufacturers exactly the dates when these pipes were made and installed. And it turned out these pipes were put in the ground weeks before Sharon was 
found. And the reason these pipes are so important was because Sharon's body was actually found above these pipes. These pipes were installed literally weeks before Sharon's body was found. So there is no way Sharon was buried there in 1983. And more disturbingly, it appears that Sharon was only buried in that car park in the weeks before she was discovered. It should be noted that Sharon's mother and those close to her, like her best friend Jane, do believe, do believe Greer is guilty, however. I wasn't sure where to include this next piece of information in the video, but I'm going to place it here in keeping with the theme of chronological order. Believe it or not, one more witness came forward claiming to have seen Sharon, and they did not come forward until 2002. Three. Bus driver Alex McKay claimed a whole 20 years after Sharon went missing that he had seen Sharon the week after she disappeared. McKay said the bus trip was from Fremantle to Perth and he picked up a girl along the way in Mosman Park and she got off in Subiaco. He said that the girl stuck in his memory for the 20 years because she had looked like a young Natalie Wood who was like an, is an old or was an old Hollywood era actress. The bus driver described Sharon as clean and tidy and happy enough. Despite this new witness sighting, nothing really came of it. So Greer is found guilty and sent to Perth's Acacia prison where he's actually, actually relatively popular and well liked amongst inmates and prison guards. He writes the jail's newsletter and helps out inmates in binding legal papers together to keep them in order and well organized. On his 80th birthday, he received an array of birthday cards from inmates and from prison guards. On May 9th of 2018, so pretty much months ago, WA Attorney General John Quigley approved Greer's release from jail on the grounds of his failing health. At this point, Greer had been sitting in jail for, as I said, 25 years, still remaining firm that he is innocent. As he was a UK citizen and his Australian visa had run out about a decade previous, it was stipulated that upon his release, he would be transported immediately back to the UK. Greer had been due for a parole review in 2019. However, due to his failing health, he requested this be brought forward. And it was decided that Greer was at a very low risk of reoffending. Therefore, Greer could be released. And tragically, three days after it was announced that Arthur Greer was to be released from prison after serving his 25 years, Sharon's mother, April Fawcett, passed away. Her death notice in the paper read, peacefully sleeping after much suffering, mother and child reunion. Rest in peace, another star in heaven. As of today, Arthur Greer is living in the UK and has not been exonerated for Sharon's death. And as of December 2018, so just last month, it was revealed that Greer decided not to appeal his conviction, much to the shock of his longtime supporters who had really worked tirelessly to clear his name and the fact he had protested his innocence for so long and it was assumed he was going to fight to have his name cleared. It's worth noting that Greer is currently, I believe, 81 years old and it's pretty likely that he's too old and sick to give a damn at this point and just wants to live the rest of his life. And that does bring this case to the present day. There is also a 60 Minutes interview that Arthur Greer has filmed since his release. It's pretty interesting. They also talk to his two daughters, one daughter that supports him, their father, and one daughter that does not. It's a pretty interesting 60 Minutes episode, even though I really hate 60 Minutes. So I definitely recommend going to check that out if you're interested in sort of seeing what kind of demeanor Greer has because he comes across as this kind old man where we don't really know 
except in the eyes of the law if he did commit this crime. I would really love to know your thoughts on this case because personally I am really torn about how I feel. There's so many unanswered questions in this case. Did Greer do it? Didn't he? And if he didn't, who did and why? Not to mention the fact where was Sharon before she was buried in Mosman Park and why were some of her remains still decomposing? Was she frozen for nine years and if so why? This whole case I think has more to it than has been investigated and I don't feel like it's going to be investigated because the law has decided this one man has done it. He may have done it, he may not have. I don't know, but there's a lot of unanswered questions. And of course, did Sharon actually die the day she went missing? That's another question I have, along with have we really got justice for Sharon? Have we put away her killer? I don't know. My head is spinning with this case. I look forward to a healthy discussion in the comments below. Like and share if you found this video interesting. Thank you for listening to Sharon's story. Stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you soon.